Thank you, Dr. Sally, for the presentation. Uh, and please uh, let me welcome uh, the last speaker for the first session, and then we will move to the uh, panel discussion, uh, Dr. Dalia Nakhla. Dr. Nakh Dalia Nakhla will be talking about net zero industrial waste. Uh, Dr. Dalia Nakhla, she's an environmental and energy management, solid waste management, cleaner production, and climate change expert over the 25 years. She was certified as an environmental impact assessment, EIA, and solid waste management uh, SWM consultant by the Egypt Ministry of Environment and was a member of the board director of the National Waste Management Regulatory Agency uh, for the Ministry of the Environment. She is also certified by the United Nations Industrial Development Organization as a national energy management systems expert. She is currently acting a pollution and a key expert as a part of the technical assistant team of the Egypt Pollution Program. Please welcome with me Dr. Depp. Good morning, everyone. It's good to be home at AUC, and thanks to Dr. Salah Hagar for inviting me. I graduated three times from AUC, construction engineering, then master's and PhD in environmental engineering. And Dr. Salah Hagar was always an inspiration, I mean, to all of us, I'm sure, his students. Um, today I'll be talking about the perspective of net zero from the industrial uh, waste uh, side. Uh, just to, uh, we'll just briefly talk about what is the approach net zero concept and the concept of industrial ecology. And then I'll present uh, actually uh, the research that I've done here at AUC and uh, seeing how we can apply this concept of industrial ecology in what we call the environmentally balanced agro-industrial sugarcane complex uh, proposal here to Egypt. So when we say net zero waste concept, we're talking about what do we do? It's about, the, from the beginning, waste prevention. And uh, also one of the uh, main uh, sustainability goals, which is responsible consumption and production. All these are the concepts that we're talking about when we're talking about net zero. It's not allowing the waste to go to the landfill or be incinerated. It's also about conserving our natural resources and not allowing them to become waste and actually minimizing also the use of our natural resources. Another concept uh, that's related to the waste, uh, uh, net zero waste concept is the responsible utilization of our resources. And then uh, also uh, being able to reuse and recycle our waste. I have to say in Egypt, we're very clever at reusing and recycling. And I think the first people that were involved in uh, reusing and recycling are the, our Zabalin community the waste collectors of Cairo, and um, maybe they didn't do it in a sustainable way, but they definitely showed us how to reuse and recycle most of our waste. So the concept also of industrial ecology, what does it mean? It means that the industry should mimic or imitate nature in um, uh, closing the cycle. Our nature is closed the, the, the way God created it, um, uh, things uh, are evolving, they grow, they are consumed, then they go back to earth and they are consumed. So this is what we call the biological cycle. And this is what happens or should happen when we're producing things that could be biodegradable or are biodegradable. After we use them, they should go back to earth and decompose and then they start again, such as when you're producing uh, in the food industry or even in the textile industry and so on. There's also the, we can mimic the natural cycle in our technical cycle. So if we're producing machines, for example, like my colleague here, when he presented the e-waste, 
So it should be, again, returned by um, uh, 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 disintegration of the different components of, for example, a machine and so on, and then reusing each component again and making it raw material to another product. So here, industrial ecology, which we call the study of materials and energy flow, since when we know the material and energy flow in any industrial system, we're able to go back and close the cycle and recycle it. And also, we're shifting from the concept of having a cradle to grave to the concept of cradle to cradle, which is closing the cycle again, just to make sure that nothing is wasted. And, um, of course, uh, the very ambitious um, um, uh, target is to have, also when you're going through the industrial ecology, is to go to the renewable energy uh, phase. So when you're using energy, go to uh, using the uh, renewable energy instead of the fossil fuel energy, which is also going towards the um, net zero carbon um, uh, initiative. Uh, also, uh, conserving water. In Egypt here, we also have a water scarcity issue. So this should be taken into consideration whenever we make a decision on you know, going to the, this net zero concept or sustainability concept. The road starts um, from the linear to the circular economy. So we've been producing or consuming in a linear matter. So uh, we're taking our resource, um, manufacturing, using whatever product that uh, uh, we manufactured, and then disposing. This, of course, is creating waste, which is a problem. So that's why we're saying we have to go to this circular economy or treating waste as a resource. So innovation, as Dr. Sahagar said, reinventing, uh, trying to find solutions like the ones that my colleagues have presented to any kind of waste, to make products out of this waste. And then comes the concept of uh, the industrial symbiosis. So the, the traditional concept was each industry operates by itself. It consumes natural resources and produces products and waste. But actually, the waste of one industry could become the raw material of another industry. And this is the concept of having eco-industrial parks or what we call industrial symbiosis. So the facilities should exchange its waste or byproduct to create a new product. And we have many examples, actually, uh, that are happening. Even in, one, uh, in some of our um, uh, uh, industries, for example, if we look at the fertilizer sector, the fertilizer sector, for example, was um, producing ammonia and, as a byproduct, a lot of carbon dioxide. So they were clever enough to add, um, for example, urea uh, uh, manufacturing, and this consumed the carbon dioxide coming out of the ammonia. And so instead of emitting CO2 emissions to our atmosphere, they utilized it to produce another very useful product, which is urine. The other thing in, in, in our, um, the concept of eco-industrial parks or having the industrial symbiosis is that you can have new industries that are um, introduced to, uh, to use um, the waste of another industry. For example, when we're talking about PET, the plastic bottles that we're using um, for drinking, these are now not wasted. They are becoming a real resource. They are having a very good market, and they're being uh, recycled um, into, you know, for a PET for um, a fibers to be used in our uh, manufacturing of carpets and so on. So nothing should be wasted in our industry. And this starts from the scale of, you know, the company level, where, which, which is the micro level. The company should take approaches of cleaner production, pollution prevention, greening their industry. And here, they might consider actually innovation in the product design. So they can go and start initially saying that from the, uh, our product should be redesigned 
to minimize the use of some of resources and to minimize the, the waste that is being generated either in the uh, manufacturing stage or the use stage. If we take also the plastic bottle that we're using to drink, remember one of the um, uh, manufacturers, they stopped um, producing bottles with this uh, extra plastic that is going around the cap. And this was a very clever move because they, a very simple innovative uh, idea decreased the amount of waste that was coming out of this plastic bottle. And then it goes to the meso level, which is you know, um, um, looking at eco-industrial parks. The parks should be designed in a way that they benefit from each other and not create uh, extra problems. This should be in the, from the beginning, from the uh, design of these industrial parks. And then it goes up to the scale of the macro scale, which is uh, in, uh, in the governorate or the region, or even um, the country level, where there should be, um, they're all working under the, um, uh, like a circular economy strategy. And, and I think our minister, Minister of Environment yesterday, stressed that we're actually in the process of having a circular economy strategy that we're working under. So now I um, would like to present this um, uh, idea of having a closing or doing one of these, you know, the biological closing, uh, closing the biological cycle of the sugarcane industry. And I, I took it from the cradle to grave, just to, to see if it could be closed to become a cradle to cradle uh, industry. So very quickly, won't bore you with the details, but the sugarcane industry is uh, actually concentrated in Upper Egypt because this is where the plantations are, uh, from Menia to Aswan. And um, uh, there are uh, eight uh, in, um, sugar mills that are located uh, also in a number of governorates from Menia to Aswan. What are, what's happening there? There is the agricultural stage and there's the industrial stage. I did not, when I did my research, I did not only concentrate on the industrial stage because there are many environmental issues that were taking place in the agriculture stage. Because when they were planting a cane, cane is a seasonal, of course, crop, planted in summer and autumn. Uh, they're using, of course, many synthetic or chemical fertilizers to produce this, um, uh, this beautiful cane that we have. But when cane is harvested and transported to the mills, what remains behind are two kinds of waste. The green tops, or what we call in Arabic, zazia, and the dry leaves, or the saphir, uh, which uh, stays behind in the fields. What happens till now is that the farmer would just set fire on the dry leaves, thinking that it's good for his land, and of course it's easier to get rid of the waste and move on with his new plantation. This creates a lot of, definitely, um, air pollution issues, health issues to the people that are living around the, um, uh, these, uh, or neighboring to, uh, to these plantations, and even the farmer himself. So this was an issue that, needs to, that needed to be considered. In the industrial stage, there were, was, you know, when the cane arrives, it goes through crushing, clarifying, thickening, boiling, and centrifuging to, to produce the raw sugar. What results here are two main things, which is the bagaz, or masast al-asab, and the filter mud, which comes out of the clarification process. These are actually currently utilized in Egypt. They, come out, come, they are produced with big quantities as well, per year, as you can see. And uh, the bagaz, uh, the sugar companies were clever enough to use it as a, a source of fuel uh, instead if they don't have natural gas, but they have to use mazot with it. Or actually there are two other industries which uh, is uh, related to our industrial symbiosis idea that are uh, working on this bagasse. One is producing paper and one is producing fiberboard, which is it's very good. This is happening right now. The filter mud, there was um, a few years back no use of it. It was just um, uh, the, the uh, sugar companies used to pay for somebody to take it away. And then they realized that it has a very good value. So people started buying it to introduce it to their lands. 
Another um, uh, waste that came out of the process when bagaz is burned for fuel, which is the furnace ash, which uh, uh, people thought there were, was no use of it, except maybe for adding it to the soil, which is very true because it has many nutrients. So this is, uh, this is how it looks when bagaz is used as fuel. It creates a lot of you know, um, local pollution from the soot and the smoke that comes out of bagaz burning. And um, uh, again, when bagaz is used as fuel, you have air pollution from uh, fly ash. You're using the bagaz. Bagaz is full of nutrients, so you're using a resource. Uh, burning uh, bagaz for fuel is energy efficient, uh, inefficient, um, and um, some of it is not even burned and is wasted. The filter mud, when it's added the way it is to the lands, also creates a problem since it has a very high moisture content. It's not digested yet, so it would continue to decompose when you add it to the land, which creates a lot of negative impacts uh, on the land uh, uh, because it still needs oxygen to be you know, uh, properly matured. Uh, it has a high BOD. It could cause pollution problems to the land. So you have to identify, this is the approach that we've taken, you identify the problems at the different stages or the different, uh, uh, through the life cycle of the product and then you see what you can do. A very important thing when you're uh, treating waste from industry is taking care of what we called or what we learned from Dr. Salah is the proximity principle. You treat waste next to its uh, point of generation. Um, it's um, not sustainable uh, or less sustainable to transport the waste to, to treat it far from the point of generation. So this is uh, also what we thought about when we were discussing um, how to go around uh, this uh, problem. Uh, we applied the life cycle assessment um, uh, to um, uh, compare between the alternatives of, um, or the other, the options of treatment of the waste. So we had the base scenario for the agriculture stage and the industrial stage. And then we started saying, okay, what's the benefit of, uh, in the agriculture stage, composting this um, uh, uh, safir al-asab or the dry leaves? Why isn't it being composted till now? Because it's too much of a hassle to the farmer. He needs to shred it, and then it's too dry. So what to do? It's very simple. He should mix it with the animal manure from the animals that he have, and he should not transport it. Yani it should not be collected from the farmers. It should be, I mean, the farmer himself could compost it in his land. Was it possible? Yes, we did samples of compost here in AUC, and we um, uh, actually, uh, analyzed it, and it came out to be a very good material with high NPKs, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium for, the, for uh, his land. And then we went to the industrial stage and said, so what do we do? Uh, the first scenario was uh, business as usual, burn the bagasse and take the furnace ash and mix it with the filter mud and also compost it or co-compost it. And it was also very successful, giving very good results. And you see, this also emits a prob the problems or the environmental issues that we were talking about. The third alternative was do not use the bagasse for as a source of fuel and mix it directly with the filter mud. We also did a number of samples and actually on pilot scale. And also the compost turned out to be of very good quality. When you do life cycle assessment, you get a very good um, uh, insight of what is happening actually, where the, the problem is, where the pollution is, because we can say, yes, there's a, uh, there are problems that are generated, but when you do proper life cycle assessment, it came uh, out that the agriculture stage itself, because of the burning of the dry leaves, contributes to more than 70% of the impacts. And in the industrial stage, the contribution is 30% of the impacts. 
So where the impact is coming from, as we said in the agriculture stage, it's the burning of the dry leaves. In the industrial stage, it was from you know, um, bagasse burning to generate steam and electricity. And because, as we said, you can't just burn it alone, you have to use the heavy uh, oils with it, which is mazot. So, and then we uh, carried out life cycle assessment again when we stopped these practices and it turned out to be, I mean, uh, the, the percentage of uh, the impacts decreased a lot and the composting led to a lot of improvements, not only when we spoke, speak about the improvement in the environmental quality, it's not just climate change, it's also local uh, air quality, pollution, it's water consumption, it's um, uh, toxicity that's, and uh, eutrophication that is happening to our soils and water and so on. So it turned out finally uh, that these are the scenarios that uh, we presented uh, with numbers. We, ca we were able to calculate that starting from the cultivation, which is the green box, uh, one hectare of sugar cane if we use the green tops as sil silage for the livestock and we take the dung from the livestock and mix it with the dry leaves, we were able to produce five tons of compost, replacing 77 kilograms of inorganic fertilizer. When you replace inorganic fertilizer, you're not just doing a favor to the farmer or to the environment. You're also doing a favor to the environment because of the manufacturing of the, the, the fertilizer. When you're manufacturing synthetic or chemical fertilizer, you're having impacts as well. So re replacing, I mean, organic farming um, uh, would have a positive impact not only in the agriculture stage, but also in the industrial stage of manufacturing uh, fer uh, chemical fertilizers. And in the sugar milling stage, we were able when we mix the filter mud with the, uh, the surface, uh, the furnace ash, we were able to produce for um, the one hectare of cane, one ton of compost, replacing 45 kilograms of inorganic fertilizer. In the second scenario, we were able to produce much more compost when we took the bagasse, all the bagasse, and mixed it with the filter mud. We produced 15.3 tons of compost, replacing 194 kilograms of inorganic fertilizer, which reduced considerably the amount of synthetic fertilizer. So it's a win-win situation. Win-win for the health, the environment, the economy, of course, and for the people that are working, the health and the social impacts of the people working in this field. Thank you very much.